Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Justinian the Great, who ruled the Eastern Roman Empire from 527 to 565, had triumphed over the enemies of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, who had caused so much destruction and trouble in the 5th century. His mighty general Belisarius had defeated the Sasanian Persian Empire and then conquered the Vandals of Africa, followed by a successful conquest of Sicily and an initial subjugation of the Ostrogoths who had taken over Italy with the fall of the Western Roman Empire 70 years earlier. However, the thriving, victorious and thus far glorious reign of Justinian was dealt a critical blow in the spring of 542. This blow was not struck by any person, but rather a disease. Yersinia pestis, or bubonic plague, struck the empire and the Mediterranean world for the first time ever. It probably came into Egypt from either travelling up the Nile or the trade routes of Central Africa, or in Ogzum in Abyssinia. It spread widely in Egypt in 541 and quickly spread around the well-connected trade routes and highways of the Eastern Roman Empire. It spread to Italy, Anatolia and the Levant in AD 543. It spread from there to the Persian Empire, infecting the King of Kings Khusraw I himself. Gregory of Tours, a Frankish historian and churchman, recorded that it spread from Italy into the southern coast of France the same year. The plague was in Ireland in 544. Within a matter of years of its first sighting, the plague had infected all parts of the late antique world. The plague then recurred in 558, and in fact continued to recur in the empire until the middle of the 8th century in AD 747, during the reign of Constantine V. One estimate, used by J.A.S. Evans, was that by AD 600, the plague in combination with relentless wars, other natural disasters, and even other plagues have reduced the population of the Mediterranean world by 40%. The Plague of Justinian, as it is called, was recorded by many of the people that lived at the time. Procopius, the masterly historian of the age of Justinian, wrote down an account a man of learning and recognising the sheer devastation the plague wrought, his account of the plague, which is the most detailed, mirrors the description of the plague of Athens in 430 BC, recorded by Thucydides. The following is an extract from the history of Procopius about the plague of Justinian. Procopius, History of the Wars, Book 2, Chapter 22-24 during those times, there was a plague that came close to wiping out the whole of mankind. Now for all the calamities that fall upon us from the heavens, it might be possible for some bold man to venture a theory regarding their causes, like the many marvellous theories about causes that the experts in these fields tend to dream up, which are in reality utterly incomprehensible to mankind. Still. They make up outlandish theories of natural science, knowing well that they are saying nothing sound, and they are content with themselves if only they manage to deceive a few people whom they meet into accepting their argument. But about this calamity there is no way to find any justification to give a rational account, or even to cope with it mentally except by referring it to God. For it did not afflict a specific part of the earth only, or one group of people, nor did it strike during one season of the year, based on which facts it might have been possible to contrive some subtle explanation regarding its cause. Instead it embraced the entire earth, and wrecked the lives of all people, even when those lives were as different from each other in quality as can be imagined nor did it respect either sex or age, for people differ from each other in the places that they live, the customs that govern their lifestyle, the manner of their personality, their professions, and many other ways. But none of these factors made the slightest difference when it came to this disease, and to this disease alone. It struck some during the summer, others during the winter, and the rest during the other seasons. So each person should state his own opinion about how he understands all this, and so too should our subtle theorists and astrologers. 
But I, for my part, will now state where this disease originated and how it destroyed people. It originated among the Egyptians who lived in Pelusion. From there it branched out in two directions, the first moving against Alexandria and then on to the rest of Egypt, the second coming to the Palestinians who live by the border of Egypt. From here it spread to the entirety of the world, always moving along and advancing at set intervals, for it seemed to move as if by prearranged plan. It would linger for a set time in each place, just enough to make sure that no person could brush it off as a slight matter, and from there it would disperse in different directions as far off the ends of the inhabited world, almost as if it feared that any hidden corner of the earth might escape it. It overlooked no island or cave or mountain peak where people happened to live, and if it passed through a region upon whose inhabitants it did not lay its hands, or whom it did not affect in some way, it would return to that place at a later time. Those whom it had previously ravaged, it now left alone. But it did not let up from that place, before it had exacted the proper and just toll in dead people, the very death toll that the inhabitants of the surrounding areas had paid earlier. This disease always spread out from the coasts and worked its way up into the interior. It arrived at Byzantium in the middle of the spring of its second year, where I happened to be at the time, and it struck as follows. Visions of demons taking every imaginable human form were seen by many people, and those who encountered them believed that they were being struck on some part of their body by that man whom they met. The disease set in at the very moment when they saw this vision. At first those who met these creatures would try to turn them away by invoking the most holy names, and otherwise exercising them in whatever way each knew how. But it was all perfectly futile, for even in the churches where most people sought refuge, they were perishing constantly. Later they would not bother to notice, even when their friends were calling out to them, but instead they shut themselves up in their rooms and pretended not to hear, even while the others were pounding on their doors. This was of course because they feared that the caller was one of those demons, but others were not affected in this way by the plague. Instead, they saw a dream vision in which they suffered the same thing at the hands of the entity standing over them, or else they heard a voice predicting to them that their names would be placed on the lists of those who were about to die. Most people, however, were taken ill without the advance warning of a waking vision or a dream. They fell ill in the following way. Suddenly they became feverish. Some of them, when they rose from sleep, others while they were walking about, and still others while they were doing any odd thing. The body did not change its colour and become warm as during a regular fever, nor did it burn up. Rather the fever was so feeble from its beginning all the way to the evening that it gave no cause for worry even to the victims themselves or to their doctors who touched them. In fact, no one fell ill in this way believed that he would die from it. But then on the same day for some people, or on the next for others, at any rate no more than a few days later, a bubonic swelling appeared. This happened not only in that part of the body, below the abdomen, which is called the bubon, but also inside the armpit, in some cases by the ears, while in others at various points on the thigh. Up to this point, the symptoms of the disease were more or less the same for everyone who contracted it. But as for what followed, I am not able to say whether the variation in its progression was due to the differences in bodies, or because it followed the will of him who introduced the disease into the world. While some fell into a deep coma, others developed acute dementia, but both felt the fundamental effects of the disease. Those who became comatose forgot all about their loved ones and seemed to be always asleep. If someone cared for them, they ate in the meantime, but those who were abandoned died of starvation. Those gripped by the madness of dementia, on the other hand, could not sleep and became delusional, imagining that people were attacking them in order to kill them, 
they became hysterical and fled at a run, shouting loudly. So those who were caring for their needs were driven to exhaustion and constantly faced unheard of difficulties. For this reason, everyone pitied the latter no less than their patients, not because they were all affected by the disease through proximity, for no doctor or layman contracted this misfortune by touching any of the sick or the dead, given that many who were constantly burying the dead or caring for the sick, even those unrelated to them, continued to perform the service against all expectation, whereas many who contracted the disease from an unknown source died directly. Rather, they pitied them because they had to endure a great hardship. For their patients kept falling out of bed, rolling around on the floor, and they would have to put them back, and then they would long to rush out of their houses, and they would have to force them back by pushing and pulling them. If any came near to water, they wanted to throw themselves in, but not because they needed to drink, for most rushed into the sea. Rather, the cause was mostly the mental illness. Food also caused them much pain, as it was not easy for them to eat. Many died because they had no one to look after them, were done in by hunger, or threw themselves from a height. Those who did not become delirious or comatose died, unable to endure the pain brought on by the mortification of the buboes. Now, one might deduce that the same thing happened to the others too, but as they were utterly besides themselves, they were unable to sense the pain, the illness of their minds took all sensation away. Some doctors were at a loss because the symptoms were unfamiliar to them, and believing that the focus of the disease was to be found in the buboes, decided to investigate the bodies of the dead. Cutting into some of the buboes, they found that a kind of malignant carbuncle had developed inside. Some died immediately, others after many days. In some cases, the body blossomed with dark pustules about the size of a lentil. These people did not survive a single day, they all died immediately. Many others suddenly began to vomit blood and perished immediately. I have this to state too, that the most eminent doctors predicted that many would die who shortly afterward were unexpectedly freed of all of their maladies, and they also claimed that many would survive who were destined to perish almost immediately. Thus there was no cause behind this disease that any human reason could grasp, for in all cases the outcome made little sense. Some were saved by taking baths, others were no less harmed by it. Many who were neglected died, but many others paradoxically survived. Likewise, the same treatment produced different results in different patients. In some, no method of survival could be found by man, whether to guard himself that he not be exposed to the disease at all, or to survive that misfortune once he had contracted it. For its onset was inexplicable, while survival from it was not under anyone's control. As for women who were pregnant, death could be foreseen if they were taken ill with the disease. Some had miscarriages and died while others perished in labour along with the infants they bore. It is said, however, that three new mothers survived while the infants did not, and that one died in childbirth, though her child was born and survived. In cases where the buboes grew very large and discharged pus, the patients overcame the disease and survived, as if it was clear that from then the eruption of the carbuncle found relief in this way. For the most part, this was a sign of health. But in cases where the buboes remained in the same condition, these patients had to endure all the misfortunes that I just described. It happened for some that the thigh would become withered, and because of this the bubo would grow large but not discharge pus. In the case of others who happened to survive, their speech was not unaffected, and they lived afterwards with a lisp and barely able to articulate some indistinct words. The disease lasted four months while it ran its course in Byzantium, but it was at its peak for free. For at first only a few people died above the usual rate, but then the mortality rose higher until the toll in deaths reached 5,000 a day. And after that, 
it reached 10,000, and then even more. In the beginning, each would arrange in person for the burial of the dead from his own house, whom they would even throw into the graves of others, either by stealth or using violence. But then confusion began to reign everywhere, and in all ways. Slaves were deprived of their masters. Men who were previously prosperous now suffered the loss of their servants, who were either sick or dead, and many households were emptied by people altogether. Thus it happened that some notables were left unburied for many days because there was no help to be had. So the responsibility of handling this situation fell, as was natural, upon the emperor. He posted soldiers from the palace and made funds available, appointing Theodorus to supervise this task. This was the man in charge of imperial responses, that is, his job was to convey to the emperor all the petitions of suppliants and then inform them of his decisions. In the Latin tongue, the Romans call this office a referendarius. So those whose houses had not fallen so low as to be entirely deserted provided in person for the burial of their own relatives. Meanwhile, Theodorus was burying the dead that had been abandoned by giving the emperor's money and spending his own as well. And when the existing graves were full of dead bodies, as first they dug up all the open sites in the city, one after another placed the dead in there, each person as he could, and departed. But later those who were digging these ditches could no longer keep up with the number of those dying, so they climbed up the towers of the fortified enclosure, the one in Sikai, tore off the roofs and tossed the bodies there in a tangled heap, piling them up in this way, just as each happened to fall. They filled up virtually all the towers, and then they covered them again with their roofs. A foul stench would waft from there to the city, and bring even more grief to its people, especially if the wind was blowing from that direction. All the customs of burial were overlooked at this time, for the dead were neither escorted by a procession in the customary way, nor were they accompanied by chanting, as was usual. Rather, it was enough if a person carried one of the dead on his shoulders to a place where the city met the sea and threw him down, and there they were thrown into barges in a pile and taken to who knows where. At that time also, those elements of the populace who had formerly been militants in the circus fan clubs set aside their mutual hatred and together attended to the funeral rites of the dead, carrying in person and burying the bodies of those who did not belong to their colour. Even more those who previously used to delight in the shameful and wicked practices in which they indulged. Well, these people gave up the immorality of their lifestyles and became religious to an extreme degree. However, this was not because they really understood what it means to be wise, nor because they had suddenly become lovers of virtue, for it is impossible for a person to so quickly change what nature has implanted in him, or the habits he has acquired over a long period of time, unless of course some divine goodness touches him. For the time being, however, almost everyone was so astounded by what was happening, and believed that they were likely to die immediately, that they temporarily came to their senses out of pure necessity, as could only be expected. In fact, as soon as they overcame the disease and were saved, thinking that they were now in the clear, given that the evil had moved on to some other people, they completely reversed course again in their character and became even worse than they had been before, making a spectacle of their inconsistency in their behaviour. Their malice and immorality now quite overpowered their better selves. One could not therefore utter a falsehood if he were to assert that this disease, whether by some chance or providence, carefully picked out the worst people and let them live. But these things were understood only afterward. It was not easy in those times to see anyone out and about in Byzantium, for all were holed up in their homes. Those who happened to be healthy of body were either tending to the sick or mourning for the dead. If you happened to chance upon someone going out, he was carrying one of the dead. All work came to a standstill, and the craftsmen set aside all their trades as did anyone who had some project at hand and a true famine was careering about in a city that nevertheless abounded in all goods. 
It seemed difficult to find enough bread or an adequate supply of anything else. Such a thing was, in fact, worthy of mention. Therefore, it seemed that some of the sick, too, lost their lives before their time because they lacked the necessary sustenance. The whole experience may be summed up by saying that it was altogether impossible to see anyone in Byzantium wearing the Chalmese, especially when the Emperor himself fell sick, too. He, too, developed a bubo. In a city holding dominion over the entire Roman Empire, everyone was wearing civilian clothes and privately minding his own business. That was how the plague affected Byzantium and the other Roman lands. It spread also to the Persian lands, as well as all the other barbarians. I have been your host Daniel Maynard. Please do like, subscribe and share this video. And this has been Eastern Roman History.